Within the vastness of southern Africa, a timeless subcontinent of majestic mountains and lush valleys, contrasted by arid deserts and dry bushlands, there are thousands of sightings of UFOs, dating as far back as the legendary Khoi San cave paintings. Since the dawn of time, man has contemplated the origins of life in the universe and looking up at the star-filled heavens, wondered if anyone else was out there. For Elizabeth Clara, there certainly was someone else out there, a man called Archon, who arrived in a spacecraft from the constellation of Alpha Centauri. His visits to Earth from Elizabeth's early childhood were to shape her entire life. Their love grew throughout their meetings, and in her adult life, Elizabeth and Archon had a child, a son, who now lives on the home planet of Meton. Our story begins on a farm in the shadow of the Drakensberg Mountains, where Elizabeth grew up. I'd like to ask you how old you were when you saw your first spacecraft. I was seven years old, and my sister and I were feeding the puppies in the stable yard at the time. And the sun had just set beyond over the Drakensberg, but it was still very light because it was summertime. And uh, this enormous craft came across, quite horizontally, across the sky. And it was as big, as big almost, in fact, as a football. And it was quite beautiful, it was about this size. And it shone with a blue-white light. And of course, I was thrilled to bits. I, I knew exactly, I knew something was there. And um, my sister's face was one of absolute fright, really. And the puppies got a fright. They ran yelping into their kennel. And then immediately, of course, we ran for the house where our parents were sitting on this very wide veranda, as the South African name for it is Stoop. I used to go after that, take my pony and ride up to the favorite hilltop with a dip in the top. And I'd go and lie there in the grass, watching the sky, hoping for this beautiful starship, because I knew then it was definitely from elsewhere, nothing from Earth. Where was this, actually? It was on the farm in Natal, in the Natal Midlands, which is a very beautiful area, and leading towards the foothills of the Drakensberg. It wasn't until many years later that I saw the same craft a second time and that, of course, after I had married my first husband, who was a pilot, and um, we were flying up from Durban to Baraguanath, and Baraguanath in those days was an airfield. It was still light, and we were in a light aircraft, a high-wing monoplane, a DH, that's a de Havilland craft, um, a leopard moth, and... Um, my husband was the pilot and I was the navigator and it's a two-seater plane I was sitting directly behind him and I looked to the east to get my bearings when I saw this bright blue-white light heading for us and it came straight towards us and as it approached us on a complete collision course it slowed speed and simply paced beside us. And I tapped my husband on the back of his neck and he turned and saw this craft. And of course, immediately he forgot about piloting the, the aircraft and we lost altitude. But I had my nose glued against the starboard window. And of course, it's a cabin plane and um, there was this enormous craft pacing beside us. 
enormous hull, completely circular, with a flattish dome in the middle. The traditional explanation of a flying saucer. A complete flying saucer. And beneath it were the most beautiful colors of the spectrum that were coming from under the craft, while from the portholes there was a softer light emanating. Then suddenly, it simply shot up into the sky in a great burst of white light and was gone completely. And you, in fact, were a pilot, were you not? Yes. At that time? Before then, yes. And you went to Cambridge University? Yes. Well, what did you study there? Meteorology. I was there for four years. I went to Girton College. What did you do during the war? Well, I was in Air Force, South African Air Force Intelligence, and I was seconded to the Royal Air Force. And that was after we had been. My first husband, of course, I mentioned before, was a very brilliant test pilot. And we were stationed at the Havilands at Hatfield in England. And there we did a lot of research and particularly in a certain aircraft, which we codenamed TK-4, which of course turned out to be the Spitfire with the Rolls-Royce engine. When did you actually first meet Archon? That was way back in the 1950s. Now, I was here in Johannesburg, and my sister phoned me one day and said, the Zulus are seeing what they call the lightning bird. And when my sister told me on the phone, the lightning bird is in the sky, I immediately got my daughter and my son and Susan the dog, <laughs> lovely dog, she was beautiful, and um, uh, Vicky the, the little um, terrier and packed them into the MG, and off we went down to the farm. I felt this wonderful feeling. It makes you shiver, and it was the most beautiful feeling of warmth, of love enfolding you. I can almost burst into tears when I think about it. And this was even actually before you met him. That's right, yes. So the very next day, I went up to the mountain I used to go to on my pony as a child. And this time I didn't ride on my horse. I walked up and there's a dip in the top and I went and sat in the dip where I'd done so in the past. Suddenly I saw a flash in the blue and I thought it could be a white bird. And then again, I saw this flash in the blue sky. And then this enormous, ship came from behind a cloud and came down and hovered about the height of the ceiling some distance from me and the long seeding grass of autumn was agitated and flattened by the tremendous force coming from her and i felt this hot blast of air strike against my face and I couldn't move any further. It seemed to be an invisible wall. And I stood my ground and I watched the ship. I looked at her and there were three portholes facing towards me. Then I forgot about observing the ship because I could see a man standing at the center porthole. Despite the brightness of the ship herself, she was shining in a very bright blue-white light that emanated from the skin of the ship herself. But despite that, I could see clearly through the porthole this, I could see he was a tall man and he stood there with his arms folded across his chest and just looked back at me. And I stood my ground and looked back at him and I was fascinated by his face. 
Were you frightened? Not, no. I didn't feel any fear. I felt a complete, compelling effect that I just wanted to go straight to him. But I couldn't because of this heat field around the ship. And it was like, as I said, an invisible wall. And I just couldn't move. So I stood there and looked back at him. I was absolutely fascinated by this wonderful face when suddenly the starship started to rise. Then she suddenly shot up into the sky and disappeared in a great flash of white light and she was gone. And I, I felt as if I was going to go up with her with a pull of gravity. So I sat down suddenly in the grass. My hat went up into the sky. I never saw it again. It just disappeared. And so I just remained sitting in the grass, wondering, now what's gone wrong? What have I done wrong? There must be something. And I sat there for a long time thinking about it all. And how long was it, in fact, before you saw him again? It wasn't until 18 months later that my sister again phoned me and said, you'd better come down because the lightning bird again is in the sky and the Zulus are very excited. And uh, so off we went again in the MG down that long road as it was in those days and back to the farm. And early next morning, about seven o'clock, I went to the mountain top. And there, as I topped the northern ridge of the dip, I saw the starship landed in the dip. And she was landed flat on the ground. And standing beside her was a tall man. I never hesitated. I ran straight to him. And I held out both my hands to him. And he took them, saying, you're not afraid this time. I couldn't say anything. I just shook my head. I was out of breath. I was so excited. And then everything happened at once. He just picked me up like a feather and stepped onto the hull of his ship and in through the open doors. And he said now in perfect English when he spoke to me. He said, look, at the viewing lens. And there was this viewing lens set in the middle between two half moon benches. Uh, was it something quite large? It, or how it did was it look? about this high from the floor. And it was rounded and it was set in a circlet of gold into the floor. And it had the most beautiful golden color. It was a crystal. Oh, I see. And he said, look into that and you will see everything you wish to see. And he came and sat beside me and took both my hands in his to reassure me. And at the same time, I noticed the other man who was sitting at the controls. And I will always remember his brilliantly white teeth. And as he flashed a smile at me. And I felt quite relaxed. and. It was the most wonderful thing as I saw the vision of Earth as we rose in the viewing lens. And he said, you know, we have no language problems because we learn all languages through monitoring your radio, your TV, and observing people of Earth very closely through this viewing lens. We can even view anything right down through buildings into cellars. We can hear everything you say as if we were there ourselves. And it all comes through this viewing lens. Then Arkin said, now we're taking you to the mothership. And he explained that the mothership is an enormous craft, like a miniature planet. And also, this is a vintage ship. 
they don't wear out, so they still use them. And um, so then eventually, through the viewing lens, I saw the mothership taking shape with a great ashen light around her. Where did Archon actually come from? From our neighbor system, a star system known as Alpha Centauri. This is a triplet system with two very large stars and a smaller star. And the smaller star is known as Proxima Centauri. And it's only four light years from us, from this solar system, where we are here with the sun. And there are seven planets in orbit around Proxima. And that is his home planet, one of those planets. Are the other planets inhabited around that sun? All inhabited, yes, by the same civilization. Was the mothership the same shape as the spacecraft you were in? No. She was a cigar-shaped craft. And remember, this is an enormous vintage ship. And uh, these were the actual ships that they moved out from Venus to Earth millions of years before. The planet we call Venus yes, today was right. their original home. That Going was their original home, but Venus died in the solar expansion, which happens in epochs of time. Can you describe the interior? The first enormous room I saw, there were plants and flowers and trees actually growing in there. And instead of having carpeting or anything like that, there was a most beautiful blue grass covering the whole floor, about that long. And it had the most beautiful fragrance. And there was even a stream and there was a waterfall. Good heavens. Must have been very, very beautiful. And there were many people. And of course, the atmosphere was so beautiful with a higher oxygen content and you felt so well and so vigorous and um, then Arkin sat me down he said you must be feeling tired after all this excitement and there were many people around who came also greeted me and um, I felt very out of place in my earth clothes you know heavy scotch kilt and jerseys and things like that and walking shoes and <laughs> <laughs> what were they wearing that you felt so out of place well they were in very simple garments just one garment made of silk and it just hung in folds it was beautiful in various colors the men and women were both wearing these kaftan like garments or the women wore the kaftans yes but the men had on a simple shirt type of thing with a round neck very simple also made of silk and um, just a pair of trousers that came to the knees like knee breeches and then just sandals that's all and they're all very tall all and very tall very good looking and very fine looking and of course Arkin he had the most wonderful face. He had a high forehead, high cheekbones, aquiline features, and these really incredible gray eyes that were very compelling and full of love. And his hair was golden, but quite white at the temples. And he must, he, he is, in fact, I know, I knew afterwards that he was at least six foot four. Very tall, very fine looking, athletic, an older man, but really his whole presence was something, his whole vibrations, everything was so wonderful. And all I wanted to do is to go straight into his arms. And he must have read my thoughts, because that's exactly what he did. 
took me straight into his arms and gave me a great hug. How long do Archon's people live? Uh, do they live to be very great ages? They've been able to overcome the aging process. And they don't go through this awful experience that so many people have to face in older life. So they have discovered the total secret. They have. It's a way of living and thinking and eating and above all, of thinking. People here must change their thinking. So it's a total harmonious way of being and I'm sure um, they must have secrets with their diet. Well, their diet consists of um, fruits and vegetables and this food is grown in a liquid scientifically grown and um, as you go to pick a fruit or a salad it simply regenerates itself straight away so there's no loss there's there's nothing to to worry about it's it's the most incredible way of, of getting one's entire protein and vitamins instead of getting it getting your protein second hand as you do by destroying and consuming a herbivorous animal, they get it firsthand through this um, um, vegetation that they grow. Do they taste like anything like we have on Earth? Well, they have a lovely flavor. It's beautiful. And of course, on the salads, they have a lovely cream salad dressing, as we call it, that they put on the salads. So it's made from natural crushed nuts and um, it's very, very different to anything here. It has a lovely flavor. And of course, um, it's all very naturally health-giving too. This not only feeds your physical body, it feeds your brain. Do they ever become ill? No. They have no disease or illness whatsoever because of their advanced medical science. And therefore, they're is nothing of that kind that we have to suffer here because most of our illnesses come from the mind it is mind over matter and if you suffer from stress you naturally get ill and there's plenty of stress here and also it's environmental the environment here is not conducive to health whatsoever not only because of the variable sun but because of all the pollution that's going on. Please tell me more about the variable sun. Are we in danger of the sun suddenly exploding and leaving us with a dead planet like Venus was when they fled from there? Uh, are we all right for a good few thousand years yet on planet Earth? We're all right, yes, but you see, the sun controls our weather and the sun all the time as a natural process just expands and contracts and when it expands it's in what we call the solar max which is the solar sunspot cycle and it releases these very intensified flares radiations that even block out radios as you know and um, it affects the heart the rhythm of the heart is actually attached to the rhythm of the star of your system, which is the sun. And if the rhythm of your heart goes out in any way into a tachycardia or anything, or rhythmic or anything like that, a lot of people suffer heart attacks at this solar max period. And this is not so with a younger, stable star. So eventually, in time to come, we shall have to leave planet Earth and go to another system. We certainly will, because although we don't talk about evolution, the star is changing, like in all nature, there are changes. And the older she gets, the more she will expand and contract. And she can expand out again in lethal radiation, which, of course, would simply be the end of planet Earth as well this time. He 
brought me back, as he said, to the mountain on which we found you. And then, of course, as he disappeared again in a great flash of white light, straight up into the sky, as I stood on the hill and watched him go. And then I went back to the homestead and um, I thought, now, this is really going to work out into something that's going to be very beautiful. And this was just the beginning. And, of course, I loved Arkin completely. And I knew he loved me. He told me so. When we were on the mothership, when I just went straight into his arms, and he told me that he would be back. Did he tell you when, or did you just have to wait? He said to me that next time he would land would be on the high plateau at Kathleen, because the Air Force were up, as he called it, up to this trick where he could disappear instantly by simply intensifying the field differentials around his ship because his ship is powered by light in different frequencies, which is electromagnetism, electricity, gravity. Uh, uh, we call it electrogravitics, propulsion or power system. So there's no need, in fact, to use fossil fuels at all? Not at all, no. Everything is electrical, and it's clean, and it's silent. There's no noise. Had he become widely known at that time, or the spacecraft, in fact, become widely known? Had other people seen it land and come and go? Well, others had seen it, yes. And, of course, it had got into the news, and, and this is how it got widely known. Let's go down there and find someone who did see it. We in 1974 my husband and I were waiting for our dinner and he went outside and came back in great excitement saying that he had seen a very he had seen a very great big uh, light on the hill behind the house uh, I went out with him and it was still there uh, it was a UFO hovering over the hill behind us it was very clear the sky was overcast, but no cloud around the actual light that we saw. A very vast light, soundless, completely soundless, no sound. Um, I ran inside to phone to tell my neighbors. The nearest one was my son, who was uh, on the house uh, not far away. Um, I got his wife, who said that she, uh, he, my son was in the bath, but she went out and verified that it was, she could see it. Uh, I then phoned a neighbor um, on the other side of the hill and he laughed at me because he said, you know, it's April Fool's Day. I'm not going to be caught again. And I said, please, this is serious. Go and see for yourself. Um, and he did and came back and said uh, he had seen it. Are they different from us, Archon's people? Are they, have they exactly the same biological structure as ours and the same biochemistry? No, people, they're the same, yes. Exactly Only the same. very much more advanced in their way of living and thinking. Of course, this acts on the whole body. How far ahead would you say they are from the Earth's civilization? They're millions of years ahead of us in all ways. And this even to the fact that they are a natural, beautiful people who live in complete harmonic interaction with all nature. So their whole way of life, of living, of breeding, is perfectly natural. A utopia. It is a utopia. It really exists. Elizabeth, how old were you when all this happened? I was in my late 40s. Now that time I've just told you about was in 1956. And then it wasn't until 
1957, the end of 1957, that he landed again on what is now known in Natal as Flying Saucer Hill. It was a clear, beautiful night, and uh, moonlight actually, it was a full moon, it was beautiful. And uh, I went up there, of course I was naturally, I knew how to get there even if it was moonlight or pitch dark or anything. And uh, he was landed there again, and he said, now we're going to the high plateau, Captain, because there was an Air Force plane, one of these Harvard planes, an old Air Force plane, droning around the sky all the time. And he said, let's get away from that. And we went up, and he took me up to the high plateau at Kathkin. And that was his first landing there. And um, we remained there. And he put the starship into remote control. That means she is always on the alert. And she has the, um, because the Air Force was around, we were able to be there undisturbed for a whole day. That must have been wonderful. The whole following day we were there undisturbed, yes. It was wonderful. And at what point did you actually conceive your son? Was it round about that time? It was at that time. We were landed on the high plateau, yes. And you knew even then that your son would never live on planet Earth with you? Well, I knew that Arkin would never allow it. And he knew too that we would have a son, yes. That must have been very hard for you, a very hard decision for you. Well, I was able to be with them. When I remained on the farm while I was pregnant, in the normal period, and then when I was ready to give birth, Arkin came for me and took me to the home planet. And when I was in the starship, of course, his older brother was there as well. And um, at this time, when I was due to give birth, and um, he took me in very quietly. Of course, I'd gone up then. I didn't walk. I'd gone up the track. There's a farm track there. And I'd taken my MG motor car and gone up there and um, waited for Arkin. And when he came, he landed. And I said, what about my MG? I can't leave her out there on the, on the hillside. <laughs> so he simply focused the light ray on her and drew her into the hold underneath the starship. Now this light ray is anti-gravity too, so he was just able to pick the MG up and put her in the hold. It was no problem at all. Very convenient. Well, as I can say at that time, we don't have antiquated transport like this on our home planet. <laughs> <laughs> and of course he laughed, he had an incredible sense of humor. And um, then he sat me down in the starship, where, of course, I was completely relaxed. The atmosphere was so lovely. And, of course, there was Harbin there, and, of course, uh, Theron, who's the, um, he's actually the navigator. And, of course, they navigate through the mind, which is instantaneous, and from one star system to another. And um, he sat me down in this very comfortable position and put my head back to rest. And he put his hand on my forehead and said, now just close your eyes and concentrate on what the starship is doing and how she is using this power system to go beyond the light barrier instantaneously from one star system another because remember that you're going with her and you're a part of her and you can't leave your mind behind your mind has to go too and you must know what she's doing and how it's happening how in the higher physics this is achieved and 
all I heard was this wonderful, it was a noise that's very, it wasn't a noise, it was just a sound, like a breath of wind going through the trees almost, as the Zulus say, a shawi. And it seemed to come from the outside of the starship, not from within her. And then it seemed minutes that Arkin said, now open your eyes. And I saw that we were approaching this beautiful star system of Alpha Centauri. So it had only taken you a few minutes to actually get as far as Alpha Centauri. Yes. You see... Which would take us four years. That's... No, four light years. Four light years. Yes. And there was this beautiful star system with these two larger components and then the smaller star. It's a triplet system. And as we approached Centauri and Proxima Centauri, which is a home star, I could see the planets in orbit around the star. And, of course, the colors were simply beautiful. The two larger stars, one was an orange color, which makes it an older star. The other one was slightly younger with an orange-red effect. And they were orbiting around each other, the whole system moving. In slow progression, it was absolutely beautiful. Then we came down through the atmosphere of Meton, which was beautiful. And there was a great, beautiful cloud hovering in the atmosphere with a complete circle of a rainbow in the sky. Were you at all worried about giving birth? Because, after all, you weren't a young woman at that stage. No, from Earth standards, I wasn't a young woman. <laughs> no, but I was 50 years old, which was in my prime, really. And... Um, Arkham attended to the birth of his son by simply using his wonderful healing hands and massaging me. And he put me on this beautiful divan that was covered in rose-red silks. And the lovely coolness and softness of that silk I'll always remember. And his healing hands. And he put me there. I was quite naked, naturally. It was a natural birth, and um, Plia, his um, elder brother's mate, we don't talk about wives, and um, came as well and attended to the birth and gave me a most lovely fruit drink. And I just lay back and relaxed and had a perfectly natural birth. And um, I can literally attended to the birth of his own son. And this was so wonderful because we shared it together. And then this beautiful boy, he was really a golden boy, was born. And it was quite wonderful, really. I just think about it, it's, it's a natural process, as it should be. And then Plea brought this large container with this lovely water that they have on the planet. It is a beautiful, pure healing water that's full of minerals and trace elements and put the little baby in this water, just dipped him in and out and then they die with warm air, there are no towels or anything like that, and no soap, and it's not necessary, because the water has cleansing, healing properties, and um, do you know, he never even cried, he just ta took a deep breath, <gasps> taking in that beautiful oxygen air into his lungs, and this is all he needed. It must have been very moving for you, a very moving experience. It was. It was wonderful. I had no after effects. I felt so well. I felt so wonderful. Was it very different from uh, the birth of your other two children on Earth? Well, that was very primitive. Yes. And uh, very different. 
because my daughter was born naturally, but then, of course, they gave me drugs. And um, my son, my second child, was born cesarean section. And um, it was all very primitive. It took me a long time to get over. Yes. And so this was a quite a wonderful experience by comparison. This was perfectly natural, as everything is there. I mean, my lovemaking is the most beautiful thing you could ever experience. Was it a conscious decision that you made to have Archon's child? Well, we were in love. A very great and profound love story. Yes, definitely. And when did all this take place? I had Aileen, his name is Aileen, and that was in 1958. And where is Aileen now? With his father. Did he ever come to planet Earth? Only once. It must be very difficult for you to accept that. It had been, yes. But now I have all this work to do, which Arkin wants. And this makes me live it through all over again. The planet itself, what did it look like? A beautiful planet, but everything is quite natural, and um, vast seas, beautiful land masses, Lots of trees and beautiful vegetation. And the sea, of course, is very beautiful. Really sapphire blue. And the skies are so lovely, too. And they control the climate, of course. So there's no extreme of climate at all. Like planet Earth at all? No, quite different. The but fauna and flora is different? No, there's a lot of it that's very similar, because planets are similar, you know. I didn't know. I wondered if it could be described like Earth at all. Are there roads? Are there, do people live in houses? Is there any similarity? Not in that way, because there are no roads, no railways. There's no necessity for them to break up and destroy the countryside. How do they travel if there aren't roads? In the air, in the atmosphere. They have smaller ships, just like a large starship, that are quite circular, of course, as big as a motor car, for instance, taking five or six people. And, of course, this is all powered by electrogravitics. They tap the electricity from the atmosphere, or from the sea, or from space. Electricity, light, is everywhere. I can see our technology is in its infancy. We have a lot to learn. And do they have money as we know it? There's no monetary system. It's not necessary because there's an abundance of everything. There's no shortage and there's no overpopulation because they simply move out to other planets, take over other planets, prepare them for human life or animal life, and there's no shortage of anything. You've just said animal life. Now, I would dearly love to know what their animals are like. Do they have dogs and domestic animals as we do? Well, they take them. A lot of them they've taken from Earth, for instance. And instead of having zoos as people have here, where they shut these poor creatures up, they take over a whole planet and prepare it either for carnivorous creatures or herbivorous creatures. And so they farm them out onto other planets. A question I long to ask. Have many other Earth people been to this planet or to that system at all? They know of it, yes. But apart from yourself, do you know anybody else who's been there? Not to meet on, not to meet on. Not to on. meet on. Do you think it will ever be possible for us to do so? Oh, yes. Once we have advanced in mind and culture and care and love above all. What is the religious philosophy on Archon's planet? Well, they live their religion. They don't just think it. You see, they have a complete harmonic interaction with all nature. 
And light is of all creation. Therefore, God is light, light is God. And, and this is the way of living. They have the God as we have here. It's not necessary. So they've gone beyond the uh, paternal aspect of they've God gone into the universal. Beyond, yes. yes. Elizabeth, you've written a book called Beyond the Light Barrier. And I believe you're busy writing a sequel. That's right, yes. When did you actually publish that book? Uh, Beyond the Light Barrier was first published in 1977. And when can we hope to see your next book? As soon as I've finished it. <laughs> <laughs> and what is the title of the book? The Gravity File. The Gravity File. Yes. And this deals with what is happening and what has happened behind the scenes. I'm no longer bound by the Official Secrets Act after 35 years. And so I'm putting everything in it. I'm not, I'm simply not going to leave anything out. Is there, in fact, an international conspiracy to cover up all knowledge of spacecraft? Oh, yes, definitely. Very definitely. There's a complete international cosmic cover-up to keep all information from the world, the public in general. This is very definite, and it is above top secret. Elizabeth, you obviously have a mission here on Earth. What is the nature of that mission? It's a very wonderful mission, and it gives me a great pleasure to do it, because Arkan asked me to do it, and that is to inform people, to tell them, to write books, to appear either on television or to get my story into newspapers, magazines, and to lecture to schools, particularly a lot of young people, so that they grow up with this knowledge in their minds of what's going on out there in space and what is to come and what will happen. There is a message from Arkan civilization and that is one of hope for planet Earth and its inhabitants. And you must not despair because all will be well. <laughs>